morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God. His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Thank you to the generous underwriters of Sharper Iron, the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. And Luther Classical College, a college for Lutherans by Lutherans, opening in fall 2025. Learn more at lutherclassical.org. On this Monday, July 3rd, we are starting a month-long journey through selected psalms, just like we did last summer. The Psalter is a familiar book for Christians. We hear selections of it regularly in the Divine Service, and many familiar hymns are paraphrases of these beloved chapters of Scripture. There are always beautiful gifts of God to be found in the Psalter, both as he speaks his word to us, and we use that very word to speak back to him in prayer. To get us started in the Psalms during this month of July, we will be starting at the beginning today with Psalm 1. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Nate Hill. Pastor Hill serves at St. Michael's Lutheran Church in Winchester, Texas. Pastor Hill, welcome back to Sharp Iron. Well, good morning, Pastor Apple. Great to be with you today. So, Pastor Hill, we have spent several weeks in the book of Revelation, which is an entirely different genre of Scripture than the Psalter. So help us get our minds in the right place to be reading the Psalms. It's such a, a big book, such a variety of things that we will encounter here. What do we need to know as we start to approach the Psalter for this month of July? Yeah, to orient ourselves to the study this summer, I think we would just cover a few introductory items about the Psalms. The first thing that jumps out to me is it is sitting at the beginning of one of the three major divisions of the Old Testament as it is traditionally uh, divided up. Traditionally, the Old Testament is divided as the, the law, the prophets, and the writings. Um, the Hebrew, uh, it's, it's for, referred to as the Tanakh, uh, the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Kethubim. I think I'm pronouncing that right, if I recall. Um, and as the beginning of the writings, um, it is a, a switch in genre of, of the Old Testament that's going to focus on wisdom themes and practical themes and, well, I mean, just all kinds of themes, really. And bound up within the book of Psalms, we'll find all kinds of different genres, all kinds of different authors, all kinds of different time periods in which the Psalms were written. In some ways, we could view the Psalms as being sort of an Old Testament distilled down into one book. Um, of course, we don't want to minimize the Old Testament um, and write it off. That's a, a grave theological error. But to understand that in the Psalms, we can see so many themes of what's taken place in the Old Testament and pointing forward to the New Testament realization and uh, completion of the covenant in Christ. So it's just a really very rich book. It's the hymn book of the Old Testament. It's still in liturgical use today, not only in our tradition, but used variously in other Christian traditions as well. Um, it's just a very applicable, important book for us to be digging into, and that's why I'm so glad that you're going on this summer study of the Psalms today. It's It would be hard to go through all 150 of them, so I guess it's probably good that we're not doing that and, and going about it that route, but what you've done to set aside this month uh, is really going to be valuable for your listeners as we dig into the text. Yeah, last last year we engaged the book of Psalms after having looked at Luke and Acts and seen several Psalms figure prominently in terms of speaking about Jesus ahead of time, so we looked at those Psalms, and again, it seemed good to take another jaunt into the Psalter this summer as well, to continue to see the Word of God there, to be able to pray that Word of God and experience the great variety that is there. Also, as you said, all pointing us to Jesus crucified and risen for us. So you mentioned that there are a number of authors within the Psalter. It's a very expansive book in terms of its date as well. Again, we're only covering Psalm 1 today, but just as we prepare to look at this book over this month, give us some of those the expansiveness of the Psalms in terms of author, date, and those kinds of things. Right, yeah, let's talk first in, in terms of date, because date and authorship sort of goes together here. Um, so many times when we come to one of the books of the Bible, um, we have this knee-jerk reaction as conservative biblical theologians to talk about how the text has not been compiled or changed over time, right? As, as many people falsely claim about many of the other books of the Bible. The Psalter is a little bit different. Uh, the Psalter, we all understand to have been 
compiled over many centuries, in fact, really over a millennia. We believe that the uh, book of Psalms was compiled beginning in the days of Moses, Moses, of course, being the earliest writer of any of the Psalms as far as uh, biblical history and chronology goes, and for it to have been continued to be compiled and written all the way through the Persian period in the 5th century BC. So you've got from the 15th century with Moses to the 5th century, the book of Psalms, um, I wouldn't say changing, that's not the way to look at it, but being compiled into the unit under the guidance of the Holy Spirit that it was intended to be and canonized and handed down to the church in its current form. So I think that's really interesting that we can dig into some of those questions that would be appropriate to the Psalms that aren't appropriate to other sections of Scripture. Um, about two-thirds of the Psalms do have an author or at least a person's name associated with them. Um, the names that are associated would include Moses and David, um, uh, Heman, Asaph, Jeduthun, the sons of Korah, Solomon, Ethan, and the rest are then anonymous. The question is, what does each associated name have to do with the Psalms? Sometimes the Psalms are written by the person whose name is associated with them, which is probably the most common way that that goes, or sometimes it could have been written for the person or about the person who's named. So we do have um, a connection of the Psalms to historical individuals that we can cross-reference in other sections of the Scripture and understand more about them. And the rest of the Psalms are anonymous, of course, and that's okay. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, what we'll be looking at today is one of those anonymous Psalms. But uh, just such an interesting thing that it's been compiled over time. And it's the same way that I think we look at our hymnal today. As you look at the bottom of each hymn, we'll see that our hymnody that has been compiled into the Lutheran service book in our church uh, comes from a wide variety of time periods and authors, yet it comes together and provides a framework for the worship life of the church. Hmm. So with that variety in the Psalter, in terms of its dates and in terms of its authors, what are the different types of psalms that we will encounter in this book? And again, knowing that we have just a month here, we're not going to tackle all 150, but in general, what kinds of psalms do we see? Well, it depends how you want to classify them and how granular you want to get in your classification system. So the psalms themselves don't necessarily label their genre as we read them. Uh, but we're able to ascertain how the author intended them to be read and how uh, the Lord would have us receive them and understand their meaning. Some of the uh, most common genres that are spoken of, of course, would be the wisdom psalms. Um, there are many messianic or royal psalms in which we're speaking of uh, the promise of this new David to come, the Messiah in Christ, and we see so clearly uh, him prefigured and foretold in the Psalter. Another common type of psalm would be psalms of lament. Some of those are individuals who are lamenting uh, their own sin or perhaps lamenting more so their own treatment in the world because they belong uh, to the Lord. And it's a pouring out of, of one's complaints to God. Uh, what's wonderful about the, the laments, whether they're community or individualistic, is they do pretty well always turn to a confession of faith, even in the the midst of the lament. Um, there are psalms of praise, psalms that would be used uh, in liturgical worship. Uh, the psalms of ascent were the psalms that would often be uh, used as one would ascend towards uh, Jerusalem up to the Temple Mount, as one would be coming for the annual festivals or used by the priests themselves. Uh, even today, we have a common practice in our own church at the um, intro it in the, in the divine service the psalm is read or chanted or spoken responsively, and that is the time, you know, traditionally where one will uh, approach the uh, altar for the first time, ascending whatever stairs are still there as a echo of, of that practice in the Old Testament. Um, and then, of course, there are a few psalms that just really uh, attack our sensibilities. We'd call those the imprecatory psalms, in which the uh, psalmist is calling down wrath upon his enemies or upon the enemies of God. And within this month of July, we will be looking at a variety of those genres of, of psalms. And as you said, sometimes the, the divisions aren't as clean as maybe we'd like to be, but those are the topics that we will encounter throughout this book of psalms. One more thought on, on the book of psalms, with such a wide variety of these different ways that the poetry speaks, 
Can you maybe talk just a little bit about the fact that we are reading poetry here? As I mentioned, we've been studying Revelation, which is apocalyptic, and that requires a certain type of reading of that, recognizing what it is. In terms of the fact that we're looking at poetry, how does, and, and hymnody and, and praying, I mean, all those, how does that affect the way that we read the Psalms? Right. Um, biblical poetry, Old Testament poetry, is marked by a number of characteristics, some of which come across in English as we read it in our translations today, and some of which are a little bit lost if they're not read in the uh, original Hebrew language. The biggest feature of this uh, Hebrew poetry that we'll see uh, in the Psalms and in other places where the poetic form is employed is the idea of parallelism. Parallelism in thought, uh, where oftentimes a statement will be rendered in one manner and then repeated with slightly different terms. Uh, it's a repetition, not so much of the ending of a word in the way that things rhyme in English, but a repetition of thought. Uh, they, they rhyme in their concept, we might say, in the, in the Psalms. There is also, um, in the, the sounds that are used in the Hebrew language as they are, are read and prayed, there can also be some repetition of the actual sounds or play, plays upon, playing upon words, but that generally doesn't render into our English translation uh, but would be recognized more so in the original Hebrew. But we'll be looking for that parallelism. We'll also be looking for contrast oftentimes between two different ways of life, or we'll look for a moment in a psalm where there's a turn, where um, in the Psalms of Lament, for example, um, one will be pleading his case before the Lord, uh, you know, complaining essentially, and then there will be a but there that will be his confession of faith uh, nevertheless, despite his circumstances, he still um, trusts in the Lord and counts upon him uh, to be his, uh, his, um, his hope and his trust. So all kinds of features like that, and it will change a little bit by genre, but uh, the repetition, of course, is most important. That gets also to the way that we use the Psalms in worship. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes we will read the Psalms responsively, or we will chant them responsively in worship, that can be done either by the whole verse or the half verse, but oftentimes if it's done by the half verse, you would have the pastor reading the first uh, half of the verse in which uh, the idea is stated in one way and the congregation echoing back in that parallel form the exact same concept in different words. So I've heard certain people say, you know, you shouldn't actually do the Psalms responsibly by the whole verse, do them by the half verse, because mm. it gets and captures that parallel sense of the Psalms a little more accurately. Yeah, and as you mentioned, sometimes that parallelism does take slightly different forms. So sometimes it says the same thing in different words. Sometimes it says the, the same thing, but it, it, it intensifies it, perhaps. Or even sometimes, as you pointed out, it, it is a contrast. So you, you look at the first half, and then you, are, you learn more about it based on the contrast that's in the second half. And again, those, those rules can be flexible, but that's the general gist of it. A couple other things that I would add in terms of poetry is look for the use of imagery, which we will certainly see in this psalm today. Notice what the picture that's being put into your mind is. And then the other challenge that can often happen with the Psalms, which isn't quite as a challenge in Psalm 1, but it is in some others, is who is speaking to whom. Sometimes you have to, you have to pay close attention because sometimes that speaker will change. Is it the psalmist? Is it the Lord? Is it someone else? You have to pay attention to those things as well sometimes to, to make sure you're getting a handle on what's being said. Exactly. And sometimes the typography of the way that the text appears in our Bible will be helpful there. Um, in helping us see some of those divisions, you might have uh, not exactly divided into paragraphs, but maybe a little bit of a space between a couple verses and the others um, in the way it lays out on the page of text in front of you. And that that is helpful for us to notice those things just as a tip to those uh, listening. So we are looking at Psalm 1 today. I think I'll go ahead and just read the text, and then we'll talk about the psalm in general and begin to look at specific verses. So this is Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. 
That is our text for today. That is Psalm 1. So let's start by talking about the psalm as a whole, Pastor Hill. I think you mentioned already in the listing of different types of psalms that Psalm 1 is often classified as a wisdom psalm. What does that mean? Yeah, a wisdom psalm is going to lay out generally a contrast between the path of the wise and the path of the foolish, the path of the righteous and the path of the sinner. Uh, it's a, a two ways type of uh, picture that we ought to take to heart. It's important for us because uh, when we read a wisdom psalm, it causes us to stop and reevaluate our own manner of life and uh, whether we are living as the the model that is presented to us in the text or whether we're falling by the wayside. It's it's a call to examine one's own daily life, one's own place, and and ultimately in that it becomes a call to repentance, to repent of, of foolishness and sin, to seek the Lord and his ways because of the fact that they are good in and of themselves, uh, that the way of the Lord is not something onerous or burdensome, but it's something that is a gift, um, uh, uh, something in which we delight and, and in which we live. So uh, that's definitely a, a part of this. And of course, what we learn from interpreting Proverbs or even Job would be instructive to us to keep in mind as we consider a wisdom psalm or just any wisdom literature in the Bible. Some of the things that we will um, have picked up from other portions of wisdom literature will need to be brought to bear on a text like this so that we don't walk away from it perhaps with the wrong impression. Hmm. Talk a little bit more about this thought of these two ways, which is a very prominent feature in this psalm and also throughout wisdom literature. Sometimes even in the Psalter, it can be a bit jarring for us because you are either one or the other. You're either wicked or you're righteous. You're either foolish or you're wise. And we know which side we want to be on, but as you said, there's often a need for repentance. Talk more about these these two ways that feature prominently in this psalm and elsewhere in wisdom literature. There's a clarity between these two ways because there is a clarity in uh, the Torah of God, the the law of God, his his ways, his teachings, his covenant, we might even say. We tend to see everything in gradations of of gray rather than in black and white. Uh, so it's a, it's a wake-up call to us to first see the clarity of the way that God himself sets out, um, and then to, to examine us uh, ourselves against it. So it, it is first and foremost a confession that God's way is clear. Um, it, it is not unclear or really open to debate. And it's a reminder as we read these wisdom psalms that this is something we know implicitly as the law is written, at least in its... Uh, most uh, rudimentary form upon our hearts. And then when we examine that natural knowledge of God, that natural knowledge of the law with the clarity of God's word, uh, then we're able to see, you know, with perfect clarity um, what is right and what is wrong. And, and it doesn't even need to be something that is uh, argued on rationalistic terms. It's something that's apprehended and believed by faith, uh, which is very important to us. And in, in I guess the cultural moment we find ourselves in Um you see, in, in this text, it lays out the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked, and it doesn't call for a debate between uh, the wicked and the righteous to see whose way will prevail. Uh, it, it calls out to this natural understanding that we have, that, that this is right, and we know that it's right, and God's Word uh, enlightens and, and shows our hearts that, that it is right, and it doesn't need to even be uh, debated, so to speak. So with, with that in mind, that those, those two ways and the fact that God's way is clear, it's not open to debate, and this is the good way, the only way, is there something to the fact then that this psalm gets put first? Because as you pointed out, the book of Psalms was compiled, written over several centuries. Is there a sense in which this psalm serves to introduce the book as a whole? Yeah, I think it does, and there are actually a, a couple reasons for us to believe this. Uh, the first has to do a little bit with the structure of the book of Psalms that I neglected to mention earlier. The book of Psalms is organized into five books, so to speak, if we were to put that into quotes. Um, and the five books of the Psalms are understood structurally because we can find at the end of each of these books, so to speak, is a doxology that is spoken there and given there. And, and we can see certain features of each book change. So for example, this is the first book of book one. And one of the features, or first um, psalm of book one, rather, 
And one of the features of book one of the Psalms is that they tend to be Davidic Psalms, Psalms that are of David, as we mentioned, and, and with his name associated with them, not all of them, but most of them. And what you'll find is that um, Psalm one and Psalm two do not have David's name attached to them. The idea is most likely that um, Psalm one is written later almost as a, a way that if you were writing a book, you would write the preface at the end with the entirety of it in mind and then place it at the beginning of the book so that a reader is going to read the preface and then be oriented to the book as a whole. Uh, this is probably the case with Psalm 1. So Psalm 1 is compiled and added, and it's most likely that that's the reason, of course, that David's name is not on it, that he likely did not uh, write it, but it was compiled and put it at the beginning uh, for the purpose of introducing everyone to the text. And the theory is that maybe even in the process of doing that, David's name could have been on Psalm 2 perhaps in the beginning and and fallen off of it for that reason as Psalm 1 was placed there. That Psalm 2 may have been for a certain time in the history of the worship life of God's people been the the first book before, or the first um, psalm before all 150 were compiled and added. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of some structural, you know, reasoning behind why we believe it's it's intentional and not random that Psalm 1 is first. The other reason we might consider Psalm 1 being first is that it shows us the fundamental goodness of uh, the way of the Lord. And we, we talk about the way of the Lord, the law of the Lord, the word behind that in verse 2 uh, his delight is in the law of the Lord is, of course, the Torah, and it's the teaching, the way. It's, it's something we don't minimize down to just the set of rules of do this, not that, but it's the entirety of the Lord's teaching and instruction, and really we could say in a way that it stands in for the concept of the covenant itself. So that all of that is in itself good. It is not a burden, as uh, the people uh, would often feel it to be, and as as many times Christians might feel uh, it to be or struggle it to be. It's a, a struggle with it uh, being. So it's a reminder that the the way, the law, the path, the teaching is good in and of itself, and and it is not uh, good only uh, in light of something else. So um, that. It's important with the lament psalms, right? Because those are going to come later, and it's going to stand in great contrast to what Psalm 1 seems at first glance to say. Psalm 1 seems to say at first glance, do this, good stuff will follow the end, right? But the lament psalms are a contrast to that to say, I've been doing that, yet nevertheless, I'm rejected. Um, my life has turned out in a way that would not be what I would have intended or what I would even conceive that my loving father would want for me. Um, why is this so? So Psalm 1 keeps gives us this notion of the goodness of the way of the Lord, the goodness of the Lord towards us before we jump into that deeper wrestling with why is it that the righteous suffer in the lament psalms. Mm, yeah, that's a really helpful introduction. And I, I think that that's something that's true about wisdom literature in general, is that wisdom literature does lay out the way of the Lord as good. And then that's the reality that you have to hold on to as you're living your life and you start to live that way of the Lord. And then it doesn't always seem to turn out like it's supposed to. And that's how, I mean, the, the Lament Psalms really fit into that. And as you were talking, especially as the idea that, you know, the way of the Lord, this is a good thing, and that we shouldn't shy away from that as Christians, especially I think as Lutherans, sometimes we hear that word law and we think negatively about it, although we shouldn't. Perhaps a helpful reminder is that this word way that we see in this psalm so often is what the first Christians used to describe themselves. They were the followers of the way. And if you think about the way that Jesus walked, that's a helpful thing, I think, for us to keep in mind in this psalm and in the other ones, as we think about the way that we follow, we're going to follow in his footsteps. That's what the way looks like. Exactly. You know, we follow in that way because we belong to him. In, in covenant relationship with him. And that's understood in slightly different terms or, or understood in part in the Old Testament and in its fullness uh, in the gospel. But um, yeah, we can have this knee-jerk reaction to say um, his delight is in the law of the Lord. Well, the law is bad, the gospel's good, um, and fall into that really simplistic misunderstanding. What, what, is saying, what it's saying really in this verse is that it is good in and of itself that the law is not bad um, and the gospel is good, but 
but the way, the path, the the way of life that God lays out for us um, is good in itself. So thinking about this psalm as a whole, again, I think on the other side of the break, we'll look at individual verses, but just talk to about this psalm as a whole. We, we've laid out a lot. What What's going on? How do we understand this message of Psalm 1 together? Right. So Psalm 1 is a wisdom psalm that clearly teaches there are two ways, one which uh, results in in goodness and, and happiness and prosperity, so to speak, um, and the other one that uh, results in destruction. Um, there are three ways that you could interpret this psalm, and um, we'll go through them kind of from uh, not so great to to the best way of understanding them. I used to uh, to think about the good, better, best, you know, uh, idea of, of three. I don't even know that I'd call this first one good exactly. Um, it would really be the biggest misappropriation of this psalm would be to understand this psalm to lay out a simplistic theological claim of do this, get that. Um, this idea of a, a quid pro quo, it's a this for that uh, type of understanding. So it would be someone, a, a prosperity gospel preacher or someone like that would look at Psalm 1 and would say um, that essentially if you are doing the things that that God tells you, uh, then because of that, you will know for certain that you will prosper. I mean, the word prosper is in here in verse 3, right? Um, in all that he does, he prospers. So if one is not prospering, then one would have to assume that they must not be prospering because they are not adequately meditating upon the law of the Lord day and night or not adequately delighting in the law of the Lord, not doing what they should do to get out from God what they want to get from God. Uh, this prosperity gospel mentality, this quid pro quo mentality is fundamentally a dethroning of God from his proper place. It places either ourselves above God in that we can manipulate him by our behavior to where he must give us what we desire if we have done our part, or conceptually, it almost puts God's law above him, right? This idea of justice above God himself, as if uh, God is bound to some external word that he had said previously but might not want to to keep in the future. So that would be the first way of reading the psalm that that would be a misappropriation and misunderstanding. Yeah, we, we certainly don't want to take it that way. Let's pick up the, the more helpful ways of understanding the psalm on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on KFUO. We're talking to Pastor Nate Hill about Psalm 1 this morning. We'll be right back. Please stick around. What do you think of when you hear the word college? Expensive? Liberal? Woke? Imagine a college that is affordable. A college that is unapologetically conservative and Lutheran. A college that won't take a dime of federal funding. A college that teaches the best of our Western heritage. A college where students grow in the Christian faith instead of leaving it behind. This is Luther Classical College. A college by Lutherans and for Lutherans. Visit our website, lutherclassical.org. Subscribe, become a patron, and join the thousands who are making Luther Classical College a reality. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Monday, July 3rd. We are studying Psalm 1 with Pastor Nate Hill. He serves at St. Michael's Lutheran Church in Winchester, Texas. Pastor Hill, prior to the break, you were talking about a, an incorrect way to understand this psalm, a sort of a quid pro quo, you do this and God gives you that. That's not the way we want to look at this. Uh, help us into a more helpful interpretation. Right, so there are two other ways of looking at this psalm and how to interpret it. Uh, this second way... Um, is not all bad. In fact, it has some some helpful uh, aspects to it. It would be to view the uh, the two ways that God lays out, and the the promise of of prospering if if living the path of righteousness uh, and punishment if if living the life of sin as a general truth, right? And, and this is true uh, in wisdom literature generally, as um, as the principles of wisdom are laid out. The more one lives according to them, um, the more one might expect to receive good things in this life, to avoid the temporal consequences of, of open sin. Um, it is indeed good, not just in um, eternal terms, but even in temporal terms, to follow God's way in this life, 
generally speaking. Um, it is always good in and of itself, but this view helps us to begin to see that there is room to understand that just because you live uh, in the path that God would have you live, it doesn't mean that suffering won't come, right? right. The previous position we talked about is if, if something bad happened to you, it's because of your sin, was essentially the view that Job's friends were trying to place upon Job to say, well, what's the, what's the terrible unconfessed sin that you've done that's causing all of these bad things to happen to you? So, so Job's friends would represent option number one. Option number two, you know, generally works unless you're in Job-like circumstances, right? Um, uh, option two works probably for most people, you know, as, as a general way of understanding the, the psalm, except if you're Job, except if you're in a, a time of extraordinary circumstances. Um, so this is a good way to understand the psalm and one that I think we most commonly revert to if our people are asking us what we should make out of wisdom literature. You know, why does it say in the Bible... Um, you know, that the way of, of, of the, the blessed man or the righteous man is going to be prospering. Um, but right now I'm going through a hard time. We say, well, it's generally true, but you're in a hard time right now. Um, so, so this is a good idea that it's a general truth and it is something we should take to heart and should be a motivation to, uh, live in this way because we need a near motivation as well as a eternal motivation just functionally in our lives. So why is it that we raise our children um, in, uh, in the ways of the Lord? Why do we read the Bible to them nightly? Well, yes, it's because we want them uh, to inherit the kingdom of heaven, uh, but it's also because we want them to be pretty decent little adults when they, when they grow up. Um, so both motivations are okay for us to understand as long as we're not falling into a uh, quid pro quo mentality here. That's right, and I think uh, we sh maybe as as those who do rightly react against the dangers of the prosperity gospel, sometimes we do forget this that following God's law, listening to His word, doing those things that are given to us as wise in the wisdom literature, that does generally make life go better. I mean, these things are good for us, and we shouldn't forget that there are temporal realities that are good for us when it comes to following God's way as long as we do recognize there are moments where we are like Job, and we do suffer even for being righteous. So we don't want to throw that out. But I, I think that is a helpful reminder that it is good, temporally speaking, for you to follow the way of God. So you've laid out two, one not helpful, one that has some helpful aspects, but maybe is lacking a little bit. Give us then the full picture of Psalm 1. All right, so the full picture and the best way to interpret this is to understand the opening phrase, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, to really be referring not to uh, you and your individual life and what choices you make and what you'll get out in this temporal sense, but to, to view the man as one who is living within this covenant relationship with Yahweh, one who is regarded by God on the basis of that covenant relationship in which he lives. Um, and that might sound like a hard sell at first, uh, but it really does make sense when we understand uh, the word Torah and what is all entailed here, and we don't just minimize it down to the the keeping of the rules. It is it is to living within that covenant that Moses was given by the Lord, which Moses went up to Mount Sinai and he didn't just come down with Ten Commandments on stone. He came down with the entirety of the covenant, the manner in which God would graciously relate to his people. And um, that's that's well for us to remember. So, and then of course, as we think about the the covenant relationship that God has with His Old Testament people, it is always prefiguring, pointing forward to the fullness of the covenant relationship in which we live uh, by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. So that is that is how it is that we will be truly blessed. And there are many temporal blessings along the way. Generally speaking, God we ask for daily bread, and God gives us you know steak and potatoes and. Uh, you know, we ask for a roof over our head and God gives us air conditioning. Um, mm -hmm. We ask for for small things and God so often just showers down his love upon us. So all that is true too, but it is all on the basis of this loving covenant relationship that we have received rather than gone out and earned for ourselves. Mm. All right, so let's take a look at the way that the psalm communicates these truths in particular. How would maybe this is another question? How do you structure this psalm? How do you see the verses going together? So yeah, this is another place where 
it's good to look at the way the text is laid out in your physically printed Bible. Um, the way we look at this is uh, verses one and two seem to go together. Uh, the editors of the SV text have left a little bit of, of space between uh, verses one and two and then verses three and four, which are seen as a unit, and then finally verses five and six, which are seen as a separate unit. Of course, all these are editorial decisions. In the original text, it's just letters you know, continuously uh, next to one another. But um, those who have laid out the text for us uh, certainly were wise in, in helping to see the structure that we ought to see as well. Yeah, and I think this is a pretty pretty helpful way to look at it. So one and two go together. What do verses one and two describe? How do they describe it? Right, so just to get this in our listener's mind, once again, I'll, I'll just read these briefly. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. So the picture first is this man who is considered blessed is defined by what he does not do, right? <laughs> not defined first by what he does do, but what he doesn't. He walks not in the counsel of the wicked. And we see a different posture of this man as we envision him, you know, walking down the street, so to speak, and someone calls out to him. Uh, a man calls out to him, and you know what he does? He keeps walking. Um, he doesn't. He doesn't say, "Well, walk with me for a while while I hear you out." Um, he walks on, knowing that his path is sure. Uh, next is that he doesn't stand in the way of sinners. So again, this image of this man walking. He doesn't listen a little bit to what the man says while he walks with him, and then stop and say, "Man, maybe I should ponder that for a while. Maybe you've got a point." And he certainly doesn't sit down uh, in a place where he will remain. So this is a, a picture of a, what he doesn't do is he does not progressively fall down into the path of sin. So each step is more intense um, to walk, to stand, to sit, uh, as far as slowing him down from that path on which he ought to be. And each person described, first the wicked, then the sinners, then the scoffers, uh, all are to be seen progressively as well. I think the wicked might in my mind, um, symbolize those who have no, you know, covenant relationship with God at all or just living in their sin. Uh, the sinners might be those who know better, yet are are falling themselves, having had the benefit first of this knowledge, covenant knowledge of God. And the scoffers, of course, are the, are the worst of all, are the ones who not only uh, sin, but cause others to do so as well, and who scoff at the very nature of what God says. Um, so, so each step, this could be shown as, as the general path that we often go on, right? First, we spend time, um, seeing how it is that the world out there lives and seeing if it looks like fun. Then we find people who might come from the same background as we did. They grew up in the church too, and they've embraced whatever this thing is that seems like it's so fun. And then finally, as, as one, you know, joins in, in their ways with that type of a person, Finally, you find yourself at the end sniping at God from the sidelines because you've grown to love this particular sin far more than you've loved him and his word. Yeah, I appreciate the that intensification that you're pointing out for us there. I also see within those three postures a sense of totality, walking, standing, sitting, no matter what you are doing— you're not doing this. And, and I mean, I'm, I'm reminded, you know, you talked about how in the Psalms we really see a, a summary of the whole Old Testament. Uh, my mind goes to, I think, one of the key passages in the Old Testament from Deuteronomy 6, where the Lord tells his people that, that he is one, you know, he, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, you shall love him with all that you are, and then he tells them these words, they need to be on your heart so that you teach them diligently, whether you are walking or lying down or rising or sitting, no matter where you are, that's what you're doing. And it seems like Psalm 1 is, is maybe playing on that as well, especially when you get into not only what they're not doing, but what they are doing in verse 2. Right, absolutely. And there's that contrast again, you know, you are going to do something with your time. Um, and and we often just aren't mindful of that, Right. Uh, we live in, in a world that gives us plenty of options of ways to just waste time. Uh, you get involved in something and you look up and you say, oh, I can't believe that much time has passed. Um, and we're not, again, oftentimes we think that the things that we're doing with our time are, are neutral. Again, this idea is that they're really not. Um, we're, we're either spending our time on that which the Lord would have us do, 
uh, according to our vocations, our callings in life, uh, or we are um, devoting that time that should be devoted to him and love of neighbor uh, to ourselves in a way that that is selfish and sinful. Mm. So take us into verse 2. If verse 1 says, this is what the blessed man does not do, what does he do in verse 2? Right, so here it says, "His but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. So again, this is parallelism, right? His delight is in the law of the Lord, on his law he meditates day and night. Um, the first thing that we should understand is delight is not a, a, an act of performance. It's not a... Uh, a work, really. To delight in something is is to receive it with joy. So again, this gets us away from this quid pro quo, I do this, you give me that God type of mentality. It's already given, right? The the covenant relationship is given to you, and, and we delight in it and take joy in it. Um, does it involve meditation upon the law day and night? Sure, it does, but it's a delightful, joyful uh, responsive type of meditation. It's different than uh, this, you know, browbeating of, uh, did you read your Bible for an hour today? Well, if you didn't, then maybe that's why things are going bad. It, instead, it's a it's a reading of the Lord's Word because we see what joy it brings um, and what what new things we find in it. So, again, it gets us away from that that false understanding and to understand this is a receptive delight for having been brought into covenant relationship with God. So, I mean, we're seeing parallelism both between verses 1 and 2. Verse 1 gives you one picture, and then you have the contrasting picture. They go together, but also parallelism in verse 2. The delight is in the law of the Lord, and then the next line further exemplifies that. What does that look like? On his law, he meditates day and night. What does that mean? Yeah, so uh, to meditate day and night, I mean, well, we get into this question a lot of times with people that, with the, the command to pray continually, right? Mm-hmm. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean uh, every moment of every day I must uh, be doing nothing but having my eyes closed and, and my hands folded? Well, it, it can't mean that in light of the totality of Scripture, but it means to be mindful of, of how our daily circumstances in life interacts with the law, the path, the way, that, that God has laid out for us in his word. Um, so if we find ourselves um, in the presence of a neighbor, whether it be a near neighbor or a far neighbor, you know, what does God's word tell us about that? What might our attitude be towards that person? Um, you know, oftentimes we uh, find ourselves in a position where we're at a restaurant, right? And there's a, someone serving us and we view them not in light of what God says about them, but in light of the value that they bring to us at that moment, whether whether our chips and salsa are here fast enough or not, um, instead of viewing them as, as one for whom Christ has died. So it, I think it has to do with that. It, it does, of course, involve a, a life of study of God's Word. Um, and at a minimum, it ought to mean daily prayer and, and weekly worship and um, going to, to draw from the depths of God's Word. Um, so if that's not present in one's life, it's certainly a call to uh, to reestablish those practices. Um, but uh, I, I guess it just entails all of those types of things. Sure, I've I've heard it said that the the word for meditation in, invokes the the picture of a chow, a cow chewing its cud. That you just kind of roll these words of God over and over in your mind, mining the depths, getting every last bit of nutrition out of them, something of, of that effect. And I think the way that you described it, no matter what situation I'm in, God's word is what I'm looking to for direction. That's my guidance. So, so there you have the picture of the blessed man in verses one and two, both what he does not do and what he does do. And then the imagery really comes out in verses three and four, not only as we hear more about the blessed man, but now in contrast, what does the wicked man look like? So I'll, I'll go ahead and read this again and let you comment. Verses 3 and 4 of the psalm, He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Take us into that that image, the way it works here in Psalm 1. Okay, so let's talk about the first of these two contrasting images. The image is a tree by a stream of water. And a tree by a stream of water, of course, is going to have its roots um, constantly hydrated and nourished. Um, here in central Texas, uh, you can float a couple of the rivers in the area, uh, the Comal River, the Frio River. And I, I assume you've done that too, right, Pastor Apple, over sure. time? 
Yeah. And what do you see along the banks? You see these trees where the roots are right there in those cool, refreshing waters, and they never go dry. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful picture. So so we should imagine something like that. And I'm sure in different parts of the country, those things manifest themselves in different ways. Um, so it is next to the source of its nourishment uh, and has nothing to worry about in that sense. So the man, because he has been, has been firmly planted, right? A tree doesn't plant itself. Uh, he has been firmly planted right where he needs to be by the source of, of nourishment, which of course is the living water of the word. He needs not worry whether he will be yielding fruit in season. So again, we can talk about the, the fruits of the faith, I think would be, of course, um, something that are very applicable here in this image. Uh, the leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Now, okay, in all that he does, he prospers. We love to take these things out of context. Well, what's a tree supposed to do? Bear fruit. It, you know, is a tree supposed to uh, take pride in being the tallest tree in all the land or something like that? No, I mean, the things that he does are the things that are natural to who he is and where he's been placed. So the definition of prosperity for the tree is, is to bear its fruit in its season, uh, not to go out and, and do something for which it was not even created. So we we can understand then this promise to to prosper in our ways, to be the prospering that is appropriate for the life of a Christian, uh, prospering in, in righteousness and joy and peace and love uh, and all of those fruits that we're to be bearing. Yep, and I think the connection to the fruit of the Spirit is helpful, because among the fruit of the Spirit are things like patience and self-control, which do involve suffering. And so, I mean, I think that's a very helpful connection, especially as we think about this as an introduction to the whole Psalter and using it, especially when we get to those Psalms of Lament. Now, what about the, the contrasting image of verse 4, the wicked are compared to chaff that the wind drives away? Right, so here we have this metaphor of, of the wheat and the chaff, and this is spoken of, of course, in the New Testament as well that the idea is that on the threshing floor, the grain are, are trodden out by uh, the animals, the beasts of burden that will run a millstone uh, in, in circular pattern along the threshing floor. And then um, the, the threshers will come with pitchforks and they will throw up in the air uh, this grain that's been separated, the chaff, the outer light uh, surrounding uh, section of the, the grain from the grain that's valuable to eat. And they do it on a breezy day so that the chaff is driven away by the wind and taken away and refined there and left behind is, is the pure grain itself without the chaff there any longer. So it's interesting because the tree itself, deeply rooted by the water, will withstand any types of wind that comes its direction. Uh, the chaff, it takes only the slightest breeze to drive it away because it's not tethered to anything. Uh, it's not rooted to anything at all. So the image is is important. The tree, great and heavy and rooted. The chaff, light and blows away. And ultimately, what the uh, the wicked promise, which is some kind of prosperity, some kind of joy. You know, as soon as the adversity comes, there there is nothing left there. The promise is always a mirage. Uh, the promise of sin is always one that that looks better than it can ever possibly be in reality. Mm. Uh, just the way that this is seen, again, in the poetry, I think is helpful to point out. In Look at how short verse 4 is compared to verse 3. I think even just in the language that's used there, you see a picture of this. The righteous one is enduring. The wicked one, not so, like chaff that the wind blows away, and that's it. That's all that's said. So even within the poetry, I think you see that same message communicated. Now, as you said, verses 5 and 6 also to go together as a pair and you see how these really start to wrap up what's being prayed here so far. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Here we really get into the language of the way that we've been talking about all along. Help us into these last two verses. Right, so verse um, verse 6, the first half, is really the way I center this two-verse section to say the Lord knows the way of the righteous. So the righteous are those known by the Lord, um, and we are known by the Lord as we are uh, called his children in our baptism, brought into covenant relationship with him. So that's the, the kind of gospel promise that we have here, is that we are known by him. The wicked are those not known by the Lord. Um, he knows them in his omniscience, of course, but he doesn't know them in this covenant relationship. So when the judgment comes, 
um, the the righteous are the ones belonging to him, the sheep called to to uh, his side, eternal glory forever, and, and the goats are the ones uh, not known by him, unnatural to his fold. Um, so I think this is just a, a wonderful promise that no matter what comes, uh, that those who are known by the Lord are called righteous, right? Again, it's not the Lord knows the way of the righteous in the sense that he has watched your way and he has figured out how good you are, and therefore he knows you're one of the good ones and you've made it above the dividing line of good and evil. Um, but but you are known first by him, by grace. Um, so it really helps us, again, orient ourselves to the understanding of this psalm and all the others. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right to point out the first part of verse 6 is the, the central theme, that the Lord knows the way of the righteous, he preserves them, as opposed to the way of the wicked, which is not known and so perishes, it does not last. How about three minutes here this morning, Pastor Hill? There's a lot here in this short psalm. Help us to, to wrap things up. How, how do we take this and use this as Christians today? So as Christians today, I think our, our contemporary application of this psalm should be that we are to love what it is that the Lord loves, right? Um, and we're to hate what it is that the Lord hates. Uh, and there's clarity in God's word about what those things are. Um, God has given us his law, his covenant, his, his teaching, and we are to drink that in. And, and live by it. And when we recognize that our own life is not in line with it, we're to, to learn to, um, to turn from those things, not just because we fear punishment from God, but because we want to love what God loves uh, and conform ourselves into his way and, and his teachings. So it, it really guards against this kind of antinomian streak that a lot of us have that says, you know, I don't like the law. I get why it's there. It's there to show me my sin so I can um, can trust in Jesus. And all of that is true, right? But it can skip over the goodness of of what the law is and and the fact that it is good and perfect and wise. And, um, and it is uh, just a wonderful thing to conform our desires to the desires that God himself has. So that, I think, is the big lesson, the big takeaway from this. And also to remember the promise. Uh, to remember the promise that the Lord knows the way of the righteous. Uh, he will not forsake us or leave us. Even if we find ourselves in a time where we feel like everything we do is not prospering, when we're in that covenant relationship with him, um, he will not uh, disregard us. And we will yield our fruit, as the Lord says, in its season. And our hope is not in this world. It's an eschatological hope, a hope that's fully manifest uh, on the day of our death, or even more fully manifest on the last day itself, uh, as Christ makes all things right and sets everything back once again the way it should be. So uh, we truly are blessed. Uh, we have received all of this by grace through Jesus. And uh, as we walk through this life, we avoid that counsel of the wicked and the way of sinners and the seed of scoffers uh, and rest in that way that God's given us. Pastor Nate Hill is the pastor at St. Michael's Lutheran Church in Winchester, Texas. He has been helping us today to study Psalm 1. Pastor Hill, thanks for being our guest today. Thank you so much. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, the one who delights instead in the law of the Lord. There is true security. Jesus Christ is this blessed man. He is the one who trusted perfectly in the Father, and even in his suffering and death, the Lord knew the way of Jesus. He raised him from the grave, and so all who belong to Jesus, the way, they too will be raised. They continue to bear fruit even now, delighting in all that he has done, all that he has given in his holy word. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions about Psalm 1, please send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. It is always a pleasure to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.